For the benefit of any of our guests here today, we have been into a series entitled The Blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have come through 12 messages having to do with various benefits that are ours as the people of God because of Christ shed blood. And this morning we come to the final one of 13 benefits that we have if we personally appropriate this blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This one is entitled, We Can Overcome Satan, but listen, only by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's what we read in Revelation chapter 12, and notice verse number 11. It says that these people from a future time period called the tribulation period, notice, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Many of you are well acquainted with a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. There's a little clip here entitled, Are You Forging Your Own Chain? Apparently, Surgeon at one time used this parable to illustrate the bondage of sin. He said, there was once a tyrant who summoned one of his subjects into his presence and ordered him to make a chain. This particular subject was none other than a poor blacksmith. That was his occupation. And he had to go to work and forge this chain for this dictator. When it was done, he brought it into the presence of the tyrant and was ordered to take it away and make it twice the length. He brought it again to the tyrant, and again he was ordered to double it. Back he came when he had obeyed the order, and the tyrant looked at it, then commanded the servants to bind the man hand and foot with the chain he had made and cast him into prison. Spurgeon continued with the application, and he said, and I quote, That is what the devil does with men. He makes them forge their own chain, and then he binds them hand and foot with it and casts them into outer darkness. Satan is a very formidable foe. I prayed much about this message because it seems like every time In 42 years of pastoral ministry, I've ever been caused to take time to address a passage having to do with Satan. I found him oppressing me in some way. And this morning, as I preach this communion message, I would ask you to pray in your heart that he would not be able to have any leeway in the lives of those of us gathered here today. May we know the freedom and the liberty of the Spirit of God as we minister and we share this message together. And even though Satan specializes, and it is his goal to eventually see people cast into the eternal lake of fire, we remember that the writer to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that the devil presently futuristically, spiritually, and eternally is no match for the Lord God. Why is this? Well, it's because the Lord Jesus took, the writer says, he took on human flesh. And through his Calvary death, he destroyed Satan and the power of Satan, who once had the power of death upon mankind. And from that day that Jesus Christ died on Calvary, literally millions of people have claimed the power of Jesus Christ over sin and his power over death through his great resurrection from the dead. And through fear of death, these ones who were once in bondage were rescued from that sin and liberated from that sin to the glory of Almighty God. Most of you who sit here this morning have become recipients of the power, the saving power of Jesus Christ 
in your life. You know, the scriptures are very clear that we can, as God's people, not just through our salvation, but through our day-by-day walk with the Lord, be overcomers of Satan. In fact, the word overcome means to experience victory, to experience triumph. And I would say that this is, sadly enough, a missing ingredient in the lives of too many of God's people. Even though we've been delivered from our sin, we know that we will not experience the second death, which is eternal separation from Almighty God because we've trusted in Christ as personal Lord and Savior. He's made us one of his own. He's become ours and we have become his. Still, sadly enough, we find ourselves from time to time living in such utter defeat. And it should not be, and it doesn't need to be. Because we possess the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. And all of the power that created this world in six literal 24-hour days, that power of the Holy Spirit is present in the life of each and every one of us. But we need to draw upon that overcoming power day by day, and we can. It simply demands a choice to yield and surrender to the control of the Spirit of God. This word overcome, they overcame him, notice, by the blood of the Lamb. This is a familiar word with John the Apostle. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, He uses that word under divine inspiration six times over, having to do with the churches, the book of Revelation, seven of them in total, knowing that overcoming power. This word overcome is only used to refer to believers, and especially those who choose to day by day surrender and yield to the control of Almighty God. He identifies those individuals as those who are walking in obedience. He also uses this term overcome three times in his first epistle, the epistle of 1 John. And now, The last time it is used by John, he uses it in chapter 12 and verse number 11. This matter of being an overcomer is one that I have seen practiced in the lives of many of God's people down through the years. These are people who enjoy victory and triumph in their life. They're pleasant to be with. They enjoy the power of the Lord in their life, and they understand as well the power of Satan. Now, Satan is powerful, but listen, he is not all-powerful. He's not omnipotent. He knows a lot of things, even about you, and certainly about me. But he's not omniscient. Only one is omniscient, all-knowing, and that is our Lord God. Satan is present. To whatever degree, I dare say, he may be present here this morning. But he's not like my God. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere present at all times. That's good news. Extremely good news for the child of God today. I want you to know that Satan is a very real person. Satan hates you. And he loves to paralyze the child of God. And he loves to do everything possible to prevent an unbeliever from knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of the freedom that comes with receiving that gospel. He is no match for our God. And if you're a child of God today, 
you can know the overcoming power of the Spirit of God over Satan in these days. Now, this 13th benefit, overcoming Satan by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, is captured for us here, as we've seen in Revelation chapter 12. There are two notable proclamations related to the blood of Christ in this passage. I want you to notice that we have the great proclamation that is made in heaven. Here's what we read. Notice in verse number 10. John says, I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven. So this is a proclamation that comes from heaven. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. Now notice. This is talking, I believe, about those living in the tribulation period who have not taken the mark of the beast, have not taken his mark in their hand or in the, on their forehead. They have not worshipped the image of the beast, which is the Antichrist. This is yet future, and yet that which applies to those who have not taken that mark, and therefore have claimed the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to take away their sin. This particular privilege of people who know the Lord living in the tribulation period is that they will overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, and notice, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. This great proclamation that occurs in heaven occurs somewhere probably around the last half of the tribulation period. And in this passage of scripture, we find that Satan is going to have a final and forever being cast down into one of two places. First of all, he's going to be cast down into the bottomless pit. Okay. That is in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. Permit me, if I can, to read these verses of Scripture. Revelation 20, listen to it if you would. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and he bound him for what? A thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Notice till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that, he must be loose for a little season. And so we're told here in Revelation chapter 20 that Satan will be cast down, I'm submitting to you, at the end of the tribulation period, prior to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, he will be cast down into what is called this bottomless pit. But I want you to also notice in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says this. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. Please get this picture this morning as you look at our future events chart. On this chart, we find that we are presently in what is called the church age period. Began at the day of Pentecost, and it will end when the rapture of the church occurs and Jesus Christ will come back to catch up his bride, the church, to meet him in the air. That's great news. It's what we're looking forward to. I said on the way in this morning to someone, can't remember who it was, 
I'm looking for the upper taker, not for the undertaker. Now listen, the undertaker may come, but bless your heart, the upper taker is going to take my soul and spirit to be with him at that time of my death. So this is where we're at right now. This will inaugurate what is called the seven-year tribulation period. It's called Daniel's 70th week of years. You'll find it in Daniel chapter 9. And then that will usher in what is called the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You can read all about it in Revelation chapter 20. What do we know this morning concerning Satan? Well, we do know this. In Revelation chapter 12, and the last part of verse 10, he is called the great accuser of the brethren, or the great accuser of believers. Okay, And he accuses believers, listen, it says he accuses them before our God day and night. So let me ask you this morning, Is it true that Satan was cast down out of heaven at a particular time period in human history? He actually was. In fact, we're told this in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I could go on and read the next number of verses, but it was the pride of Satan against Almighty God that caused him to be cast out of heaven. Now, if some of you are thinking this morning, you're saying, okay, if it's true that Satan was cast out of heaven, How is it that according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 10, that he accuses believers before our God day and night? Here is how this is reconciled. Let me ask you, have you ever heard of Satan's temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? Okay, I have. He tempted him in three ways, and we won't go to those passages of Scripture. We don't have time today. Let me ask you, do you understand from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that Satan is the God, small g, God of this world? In fact, for a number of you here this morning... He blinded your eyes to the glorious gospel for years. And it wasn't until the light dawned and the light of the world, Jesus Christ, came into your life that you realize that you've been delivered from darkness and you've been transformed into the kingdom of God's dear son. And yet, sadly enough, There are those who believe the lie of Satan and remain in their sin. But Satan is active. He's alive. He's operating on planet Earth. And the first message I ever preached at Bethel Baptist Church is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. That he is our adversary, the devil. And he walks about seeking whom he may devour. And listen, child of God, he's out to devour you spiritually. He cannot take that salvation that is eternal in nature and will never be taken away from you, but he can paralyze you as a child of God. He can harness you from being the testimony that God wants you to be. And some of you this morning could very well be in that condition. And he's been eating you up. And even though you come to church and you might pray at the table for a meal, you're not as alive spiritually as you once were. And it's time to recognize that Satan has been having his way in your spiritual life. 
And you can overcome Satan, but it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ, listen, that cleanses us from every sin. But Satan, even though he and his angels who rebelled against God were cast down out of heaven, Satan is still allowed access to the very throne of God. We won't take the time to examine Job, but you know Job? Do you know the conversation that went on in Job chapter 1? I do. And God allowed Satan to come into his presence and converse with him concerning Job's situation in life. And Job never sinned, nor did he ever charge God foolishly. We sometimes do. When things don't go our way, we say, God, why are you doing this? We might even take his name in vain as a child of God. And yet God knows what he's doing. He's in the maturing business, seeking to mature us and make us into the kind of people that we need to be to his honor and glory. And so Satan is busy. If you're a sincere walking with the Lord child of God, he's busy in heaven concerning you. He accuses you of things that you never did that God knows, knows about anyway. And he accuses you about things that you have done which are sinful and God knows about that as well. But the Lord God says, he or she, they're mine, and they're mine forever. And even though they're not walking as harmoniously, harmoniously with me as they ought, I am on their side. They are on my side. And in spite of their faults and their failures and their sins, I'm always there. To cleanse that sin away so that they can walk in proper fellowship with me. At the end of the tribulation period, Satan will be cast down into the bottomless pit. He will be bound, according to Revelation chapter 20, for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, we're told... He's going to be loose for a little season. He's going to go out and he's going to deceive the nations that are existing during this kingdom reign. And then he's going to array all of the unbelievers living at the end of this millennial period. He's going to bring them against Almighty God and all the believers living at the end of the millennial reign. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to lose. He's going to lose big time. And at that time, he's going to be cast forever into the eternal lake of fire. And he's going to be tormented day and night, forever and ever, along with every unbeliever down through the ages of human history. Someone has said, and rightly so, I've read the back of the book, and what? We win. We win. The sad thing, however, is that there's countless millions going out into a crisis eternity. And there will be billions of people that will be spending forever in that place where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever and forever. That is why it is so imperative for God's children to be serious about their walk with God and be about their father's business. 
put up here on the screen that Christ's blood guarantees a personal relationship which can never be severed. That's great news. It's called the eternal security of the child of God. Jesus would say, I give unto them eternal life. And what? They shall never, never, ever perish. No one, nothing will ever be able to pluck them from my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them from my Father's hand. You know that there's triple indemnity? There's the Savior's hand, there's the Father's hand, and there is the sealing work of the Spirit of God. You talk about a great insurance policy. It's called the eternal security of the believer. But Christ's blood guarantees a cleansing from sin, sin that hinders regular fellowship notice in this passage that they overcome him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony so that they loved not their lives unto the death where is this overcoming where is it well it's found in the lord and in his cleansing blood there's a victory of their cleansing they overcome him by the blood of the lamb it was only the blood of the lamb that saved us from our sin what can wash away my sin listen nothing you know what nothing means it means nothing (laughs) nothing but what the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus but let me ask you After you were saved, did you ever sin? I have far too many times. But when I come to the Lord and regularly ask for his cleansing, his washing from sin, he always delivers. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 talks about fellowship. He says, if we confess our sins, he faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all sin unrighteousness you know I always feel really clean when I'm coming before the Lord daily and I said Lord cleanse me anew so that I can walk properly with you then we're told notice in verse number 11 there's a victory of their confession the word of their testimony and you know what their testimony is their testimony is during the tribulation time I've not taken the mark of the beast I've not taken that mark on my forehead Or in my hand. And another thing. I have not worshipped the Antichrist. I have not. I'm worshipping the Lord. I believe in the Messiah. Jesus Christ. And that should be our confession today as well. And then it says this. They love not their lives unto the death. There's the victory of their courage. This is a pretty significant testimony, isn't it? That they're willing to stand as tribulation believers. They're willing to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. To the point of being willing to be martyrs for his cause. (laughs) I have to ask myself that question. I'm not sure that I have this kind of courage that will be theirs. But I want to have that kind of courage. I do. And I believe that when the time comes, as it is coming and is here right now, to some degree, concerning some of the activities that are going on in our political arena, our educational arena, and so on, I want to be willing to so stand for the Lord, not in any kind of a proud way, knowing that my boast is in the Lord and Him alone. I want to be able to stand that even if authorities in this 
province of ours, arrest me, that I will be arrested to the glory of God. Because I'm only willing to preach the whole counsel of God and speak against sin and promote righteousness all to his glory. You might have to remember this message sometime. Maybe you'll bail me out of jail. Okay. But we need to be willing to stand for the one who stood for us on Calvary and gave his life for us and shed his precious blood. Then there is, notice, the grim proclamation or the great proclamation upon earth. Here it is as we conclude. Notice verse 12. It says, woe or sorrow to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but, what? A short time. He knows the time is coming. The Lord knows better when that time will exactly be. When God will sentence him. To not just the bottomless pit, but eventually to the lake of fire. Let me ask you this morning. What awaits those who do not personally appropriate Christ's shed blood to wash away their sin and reconcile them to God? What awaits them? I can tell you what awaits them is what the Bible speaks of. And Jesus talks about it in John 3. Eternal damnation. That is a horrendous sentence. Listen, the wrath of God this morning abides upon every non-believer. But that wrath can be lifted. If you here as an unbeliever today, if you're willing to repent of your sin, believe the gospel, receive Christ, as Lord and Savior. The great proclamation upon earth is that the devil is going to come down upon this earth in a renewed way. And he will have great wrath. He hates when anyone comes to a saving knowledge of Christ. He'll do everything to keep you from trusting the blessed Savior. He's the father of all lies. And you and I need to stand against him in the power and the fullness of the Spirit of God so that we are day by day the kind of overcomers that we need to be. Revelation 16, 16 says this, He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. You can read about that in Revelation 16. You can read about it in the following chapters. It's going to be a horrific battle. But the Lord Jesus Christ at that time will be the victor. And those that are battling with him against Satan and his forces, they will know the joy of triumph and overcoming. We overcome Satan how? By his blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you not grateful today for the blood? There's much more that could be said. But time escapes us. But listen, read the book of Revelation. You say it's too confusing. Well, I thought that at one time. But the more I've studied it, I've realized the promise of Revelation 1.3. Blessed is the one who reads the prophecy of this book who hears the truth of it and hides that truth in their heart. What a blessing. Listen, the Lord speaks well of us when we understand and know what the future brings. We don't understand everything, but he does. But he gives us just enough to propel us to be the kind of people we ought to be for him.